is uh, Rich going to talk about some short nose surgeon in the Hudson River. So, thank you, Rich. <laughs> All right, so we've heard a lot of Great Lakes surgeon talks. Just heard about the so and last but not least, we're going to talk about the short nose and their seasonal distribution and habitat associations within the Hudson River. So, just like the Atlantic, they occur uh, along coastal rivers along the Atlantic. And like most sturgeon species, they do have an imperial status, being currently listed in 1907. <coughs> However, good news to the story, as Lisa was mentioning, we have one of the largest populations along the Atlantic coast. So, as she was showing, back in the early 80s, we had a population around 13,000 individuals. Fifteen years later, a very similar marker capture study was performed, putting the population at 59,000 individuals. So, over a 15-year period, we've seen substantial growth. So, even though it doesn't be listed, it seems like good news for this species. So, what do we actually know about this large population within the Hudson? We really didn't know much until the mid-30s when Greeley and the uh, New York State DC performed surveys up and down the Hudson River encountering short nose. And we learned things like it has some commercial importance in the middle part of the river. It spawns in late April. It's found in summer, or spring, summer, and winter, indicating that it's not likely strong migratory like the Atlantic sturgeon. Beginning in the 60s and 70s, environmental consultants began to survey the river as well, but these surveys weren't specific towards short nose, and although they encountered them, we didn't really learn a whole lot of new information from what we had learned from the 30s. Then, in the uh, mid-1970s, uh, so the early 80s, Dobel et al. came in and really kind of laid the groundwork for what we know about this species. So again, that population estimate, but we also learned a lot about the uh, life history and the uh, seasonal movement of this species throughout the estuary. So this is a figure of data <coughs> from the Dobel et al. study and also a uh, map of the, the Hudson. Uh, as Manville mentioned, it is titled from Detroit Dam down to New York City. And there's also several different gradients from north to south, one of those being the salinity gradient. So from about Poughkeepsie north up to the dam, we have our freshwater zone. From Poughkeepsie down to Newburgh Bay, we're seasonally brackish, and then below that, we're brackish year-round. We also have a gradient in terms of the sediment. So up below the dam, we have some gravel, but a lot of sand. And then in the lower two-thirds of the estuary, we're primarily mud. Until so we get closer to the uh, city where it becomes sandy again. The river also changes in terms of its width. So up north, much more narrow and restricted channel. As we move further south, we do have wider areas such as Harbor Drop and Newburgh Bay. And then, obviously, wider ones we get down to the mouth. So, as I said, we learned a lot about the, the seasonal movements of this species from the Silver Little All Study. So starting in the spring, we have our adults that migrate up north, spawn below the Troy Dam. And then in summer, they're found throughout a major portion of the estuary, from around Catskill, down past Poughkeepsie, uh, West Point, and then into some of that brackish water. Then come fall and winter, we have two main overwintering areas. One in Asopus, and then another one a little bit further south, down in Coverstraw Bay. So we have this great movement data from the 80s. Um, but what's going on in more recent years? Are we seeing the same kind of things? So the DEC initiated a study a few years back uh, to do a telemetry study to try to gain a little bit more information. So telemetry has several advantages, as you know, over a classic marker capture study, and now we can get very fine scale um, spatial data on a lot of different individuals. And then based on the study design and the tag life, we can also obtain lots of data over multiple seasons or even over multiple years. The second part of this study was to take this fine scale spatial data and relate it to benthic habitat that this species is encountering. So as Amanda mentioned, the Hudson River Estuary Program has a fantastic data set in which we have many different variables associated with the uh, So we have the we have our sediment types, 
as well as our sediment environments, so areas of deposition, areas of erosion, and then those dynamic areas of sand waves. So real briefly in terms of what we did with uh, the track and the altimetry, 97 sub-adults and adults were equipped with sign tags as shown in the, the bottom left from 2012 to 2015. And then mobile tracking occurred throughout the year and throughout the entire estuary north of the Tappanese Bridge, or George Washington Bridge. <laughs> uh, from there we have lots of uh, spatial location data indicated in these pink dots off to the right. And so the first thing we did was to plot all these uh, detections among all the years and we've been in these uh, for each season based on that previous literature. So our spring is going from mid-April um, to the end, or yeah, mid-April to the end of May, summer from June until September, and then fall and winter from October through the following mid-April. After that, we wanted to establish a spatial resolution, and we went with a 250 by 250 meter area, and this was to give us uh, pretty good idea of what was actually going on at a specific location where we detected it as uh, sturgeon, but not too broad where we could only really say anything about the, the river mile or the river reach. From here we calculated persistence. So this is uh, simply taking the number of detections divided by the number of times an area was searched. So this allowed us to standardize uh, for effort while we were out there tracking. And then lastly, what we performed what's called a hotspot analysis. And so a hotspot analysis not only takes the number of detections that are in a given area, but also the distance between those detections. And so when we have a lot of individuals in a small area and the distance between those detections is relatively small, we have what's considered a hot area or an area where we're having significant clustering of a lot of individuals. So when you see these uh, figures and maps going forward, areas in red are our significant hot areas, and then our yellow areas are going to be non-significant areas. So again, looking at the map of the, the Hudson River, uh, I'm going to go through each of our uh, seasons and tell you what we found with our telemetry study and how that kind of relates back to the uh, early 80s market capture study. So starting in spring, we do in fact find these individuals below the uh, dam and Troy. We have several hot areas, a little bit of a non-significant area in the middle there. And then when we look at our sediment data, we have gravel in green, uh, mud in red, just a little bit there in the center section, and then mostly sand up there. And I want to draw your eye to the green area, which is gravel. And gravel is the uh, preferred uh, spawning substrate for this species. And so this is going to be uh, an important uh, thing to remember with the, the next few slides forward. So we have individuals there, and then we have their uh, preferred spawning substrate. So presumably, spawning is occurring up here. A little bit further south, we have a, a little bit smaller of an area, but we do have another hot spot. When we look at our sediment data, it's kind of hard to see, but we do have a nice little gravel bar here. So probably spawning is likely occurring uh, in the, the lower section of these top of reach. And then as we go much further south, up there, above uh, Newburgh Bay, we have another pretty large hot area. And this is kind of strange if we're thinking, all right, if we're spawning up below the dam in Troy, why are we getting these areas down here? Well, out of the sea of mud, you can see right below this uh, tributary, we have a pretty long, substantial gravel bar, and we haven't really ever seen spotting happen here because we don't see anything much in the literature. But when you put two and two together, we have a high number of individuals congregated here, and their preferred spotting substrate, spotting could be occurring. So this is definitely an area to look at uh, in future springs to actually go down there and see if we see individuals in, in spotting condition. So for the, the next few uh, seasons with summer and fall and winter, I'm not going to be showing you the, the sediment data. Uh, up to now, it's been relatively simple to look at where we have our hot areas and where we have gravel, because again, gravel is a, a spawning requirement. 
And so from a uh, quote from the Dovel et al. study, reproductive condition is probably the principal factor that, ter that determines the use of a specific location itself. And then another quote from the Dovel et al. study, uh, we believe that the utilization of specific habitats exclusive of spawning and perhaps overwintering is a random response to environmental conditions. So at this point, we're going to scratch our head a little bit because it's likely going to be uh, a multivariate response if we can even find a response with these different um, with the habitat features. So looking at not only our uh, sand, gravels, and muds, but the bimetry and the sediment environments. And hopefully, uh, within the coming weeks and months, we'll be able to figure out if there is any kind of correlation between the two. So again, just the hotspot analysis moving forward from here. So in summer, they should be found throughout a major portion of the estuary. And that's indeed what we're finding. We have a couple of little hot spots up here in Catskill. Uh, another spot right outside of Kingston. A nice stretch of individuals occurring throughout Poughkeepsie, as well as down in uh, West Point, and then a little bit further south into some of that brackish water. Moving into fall and winter, uh, again, there's these two known major overwinter areas, the first being the Sophus. And we do indeed find lots of individuals occurring here. And to add a little bit more fuel to the fire, uh, thanks to uh, Dwayne and John, we have a really awesome side scan image taken just earlier uh, this year. Uh, right at that location, and so we're looking at the, the bottom of the river, and all these little yellow dots are very likely short of sturgeon occurring here. And if you look at the scale bar, 20 meters by 20 meters, this is a really small area where they seem to be packed in there. As Amanda said, it, it looks like just maggots on the floor, and that's maybe kind of nasty to think of maggots and sturgeon, but it's, it's true, they're just littered down there. So are we seeing the same thing down uh, in Hammerstar Bay? Sadly, not so much. We have a little red dot there, but not seeing this major hot spot as we did at uh, at Sophus. So let me say, though, that that's not to say we didn't detect any individuals here. If I were to show you the uh, raw persistence data or the raw detection data, you would see that there were lots of individuals that were encountered here. But if you also notice the width of the river is, is much wider here. Average draw is actually one of the widest parts of the river. And so the hotspot analysis again is based on not only the number of individuals that are there, but the distance between the detections. So if we have a much wider section of the river, we uh, likely will be able to have individuals dispersed a little bit further away from each other as opposed to focus where they were really packed in there. So it might just be the, the sensitivity of our analysis why we're not seeing this major hotspot. And so as Amanda was uh, briefly mentioning, we uh, do have some other things going on in the river besides just our sturgeon swimming around. There are 10 new proposed anchorages uh, where these large sea-going vessels will moor off the banks of the Hudson, and in doing so, they're gonna be dropping down these large anchors. And when they're pulling these anchors back up, they uh, will leave these big scars. And um, you can go and see Dwayne's talk tomorrow at 11 to learn a lot more about these. But with this uh, benthic species and these large anchors, we have the uh, potential for a direct interaction between the two. And so knowing where these individuals are at certain times of the year, it becomes very important in terms of our, our management and conservation decisions as well as the uh, power cable that we've heard uh, a couple times today, bringing electricity from Canada down to the city, burying that cable through a large portion of the Hudson River. Again, we have this direct interaction between the benthic species and the power cable going through the benthos. So bringing this all together, um, we've seen distinct seasonal distribution and movement uh, among our different seasons. So in spring, we are finding them moving up north, uh, presumably to spawn below the Troy Dam, and there appears to be a, a strong association with gravel. In the summer, they're found throughout a major portion of the estuary, from Catskill down past West Point into some of the brackish areas. 
And then in the following winter, we saw that Asopus was a very important wintering area. So the telemetry study and the Dopal et al. marker capture study are showing very similar patterns with a few caveats. Uh, that potential spawning location that was much further south that is very interesting and I'm really wanting to get out in a boat here in a few months and actually go out and see are we seeing individual spawning there as well as the, the lack of overwintering in Habershaw. Is that just an artifact of our analysis or is it not as an important area as Asopus? And then lastly, just uh, understanding not only from life history or an ecological standpoint to learn more about where these individuals are moving, just the importance of knowing where they are when it comes to the management and conservation of these. And that thank you is thank you for listening, but also thank you to all the people that came before me. I have only been playing with this data and it wouldn't have been possible without all the staff at the office and all the seasonal technicians. So thank you to them as well. Thank you very much.